Hey guys, Chef Clay Peden here from Central Arizona College. Today, we're gonna to do a little bit of a different video. We're going to actually talk about baking and the science behind it. Uh, this is going to be mostly a lecture video, so I hope you enjoy. Now, baking is a science that relies on understanding the basic principles of the baking and cooking processes. Once you understand what actions are taking place, when a mixture of flour, fat, and water become a finished product are the function of scientific principles. You will be able to select ingredients and work with formulas with much greater ease. Even though science and baking are, have a lot to go, you know, they go together. You don't need a degree in chemistry or physics. It's not a prerequisite for working in the bake shop. A good understanding of the everyday science of kitchen makes for a well-rounded professional. The first step in the production of bread or, and pastries and other bake shop products is the measuring of the ingredients uh, or your mise en place. Once measured, ingredients must be mixed or combined any matter designated to achieve your desired results, what you're looking for. The techniques used to mix or combine ingredients affect the baked goods, final volume, appearance, and texture. Now mixing accomplishes some or all of the following, even distribution of ingredients, the breakdown of fats and liquids, causing them to blend or emulsify, activation of the proteins in wheat flour, causing the formation of the elastic structure that we call gluten, and incorporation of air into a mixture or aeration to help it rise and develop that light texture that you're looking for when you bake it. Mixing methods accomplish many things simultaneously. As the table you're looking at, blending, folding, sifting, and stirring ensure that ingredients are properly combined. But cutting also combines ingredients. In this case, fat is in a unique way to ensure that the dough bakes into a flaky crust or cookie. Beating, creaming, kneading, and whipping help incorporate air into your batter, dough, or foam during mixing. The creation of pockets of air, called air cells, gives baked goods their final texture after baking. A buttery cake batter has many tiny, even air cells, which give the cake uniform fine texture. These air cells are created exclusively during the mixing process. Now remember, fats do not blend with water. Beating, blending, creaming, kneading, and stirring break up fats into particles allowing them to blend with liquids into homogeneous mixtures. Learn the difference in these mixing techniques, then use the designated method with the appropriate equipment or tool to ensure a good quality finished product. Now on this table here, let's read through the different kind of mixing methods. First method is gonna be beating. Now the purpose of this is vigorously agitating foods to incorporate air or develop gluten. The equipment is you're going to be using a spoon or electric mixer with a paddle attachment. Next method is blending, mixing two or more ingredients until evenly distributed. You're going to be using a spoon, rubber spatula, whisk, or electric mixer with a paddle attachment. Next method is going to be creaming, vigorously combining softened fat and sugar while incorporating air. Electric mixer with a paddle attachment on medium speed. Next method we're going to look at is cutting. The purpose is going to be to incorporate solid fats into dry ingredients only until lumps are desired to re size remain. Your equipment, you have your pastry cutters, your fingers, or electric mixers with your paddle attachment. Folding, the purpose of this is going to be very gently incorporating ingredients such as whipped cream or whipped eggs into dry ingredients, a batter or a cream, rubber spatula, or a balloon whisk. Now, when it comes to kneading, that is going to be just working the dough to develop gluten. Hand or electric mixer with a dough hook, if done by hand, the dough must be vigorously and repeatedly folded and turned in a rhythmic pattern. Sifting is passing one or more dry ingredients through a wire mesh to remove the lumps, combine, and aerate. You're going to use a rotary or a drum sifter or a mesh strainer. Stirring is gently mixing ingredients by hand until evenly blended. With this, you're gonna use a spoon, whisk, or a rubber spatula. 
Whipping, you're going to be beating vigorously to incorporate air, whisk, or electric mis mixer, and whip attachment. Now let's talk about the importance of gluten. Even though it is tough, rubbery substance created when wheat flour is mixed with water, it's what helps make country bread chewy and a pound cake light and tender. The flour does not contain gluten. Only a dough or batter can contain gluten. It is formed when proteins, uh, glutenin and gladian in wheat flour are moistened or hydrated during the mixing process. Gluten development is affected by a number of factors, including mixing technique and the presence of fat and moisture. Generally, the longer a substance is mixed, the more gluten will develop. However, extreme overmixing in industrial equipment can break down the gluten structure. The type and portion of ingredient in the formula also affects gluten development. Flour needs to absorb liquid in order for its proteins to bond and form gluten. Now fats in formulas coat the fine particles of flour preventing water from being absorbed into the flour. This inhibits the formation of a strong gluten bond. A high fat cookie dough that contains very little liquid bakes into a crumbly product, not a light chewy one. But the dough for a French baguette contains no fat and bakes into a solid, chewy product. Um, even if even the fat in milk will inhibit gluten formation, which is why milk is used in doughs for like dinner rolls or sandwich bread. Um, and those two breads are very tender and soft. The protein content of flour also affects the gluten development. Firm bread dough that can be kneaded and shaped before breaking, baking requires a higher protein flour than a tender cake. Uh, mixtures lacking gluten require specific ingredients of combinations to give the structure to the baked goods that you're looking to use. Now the importance of moisture. Moisture is in the form of water, milk, or other liquids as well as the moisture in ingredients such as fresh fruits, eggs, um, is of greatest importance for the final result in your baking. Throughout the mixing process, water and moisture in a formula dissolves ingredients such as salt or a chemical leavening. Once dissolved, moisture activates compounds such as yeast or chemical leavening in that formula. Even when ingredients does not dissolve completely as, a, as would salt or sugar, moisture helps hydrate those ingredients. Flour or starch, for example, absorb water, which binds with molecules in those ingredients. Now, water molecules attach to starch granules in the flour, trapping them in kind of a shell that gives baked good their structures. Water and other liquids are also very important for adjusting the temperature in a formula. Using temperature controlled water when mixing yeast doughs, for example, helps the dough reach the ideal temperature for fermentation. Um, and chilled water in pastry dough actually helps prevent fat in the formula from melting down and during your mixing process. Now the function of ingredients are liquids dissolve ingredients such as salt in a batter or dough, activate compounds such as yeast or chemical leaveners help hydrate and since moisten. Ingredients help adjust the temperature of ingredients. And baked goods are made from doughs and batters. It is the moisture content that distinguishes between the two. A dough has a very low moisture or water content and a firm consistency. Now the moisture in a formula binds with that protein to form gluten, which forms the continuous medium into which other ingredients are embedded. A dough is usually prepared by beating, blending, cutting, and kneading, and is often stiff enough to cut into various shapes. Some common types of dough are your yeast bread dough, cookie dough, pie dough, and so on. Now a batter has a thin consistency and is generally contains more liquids, fat, and sugar than a dough. Gluten development is minimized and liquid forms the continuous medium in which other ingredients are dispersed through the batter. A batter bakes into a softer, moister product, and a batter is usually prepared by blending, creaming, stirring, or whipping, and is generally thin enough to pour. 
Some common types of batters are your cake batter, muffin batter, pancake batter. And baking or cooking dough or batter drives out moisture. It develops the product's texture and creates the final result, whether you want it to be a crusty bread with a fluffy interior or a uniformly crisp cookie. Now let's talk about heat transfer and the science of baking. Once a batter or dough is mixed, the application of heat transformation into a, an appealing finishing product. So heat is a type of energy. We know that. When a substance is heated, its molecules absorb energy, which causes the molecules to vibrate rapidly, expand, and bounce off one another. As the molecules move, they collide with nearby molecules, causing a transfer of heat energy. The faster the molecule moves within a substance, the higher its temperature. This is true whether the substance is air, water, an aluminum pot, or an apple pie. Now, heat energy may be transferred to foods and baked goods in three primary ways, through conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is the movement of heat from one item to another through direct contact. For example, heat is conducted directly from a pan placed over a burner into foods cooked on the stovetop. The pan heats up and the heat is transferred from the pan to the food it contains. Conduction is the primary heat transfer method in stovetop cooking, but conduction is also just as important in baking. For example, when heat energy hits the cake pan or baking sheet placed in an oven, heat is conducted to that pan. The metal of the pan then conducts heat to the batter or dough contained in that pan. When bread dough or pizza dough are placed on a hearth in a wood-fired oven, the oven's heated deck conducts heat directly into the dough during baking. Some materials conduct heat better than others. Generally, metals are good conductors. Tools and equipment for bake shops, copper, aluminum, are the best heat conductors, conducting heat quickly to foods. Liquids and gases are poor conductors and conduct heat relatively slow, which can be used to a baker's advantage though. Delicate creams and custards which can curdle or separate when baked at too high a temperature, are baked in a water bath so they cook slowly and evenly. Stone considered is a good conductor for yeast bread making because it acts as a heat sink, filling up with heat and slowly releasing it back over the extended period of time. The type of material and its gauge of thickness all contribute to the conducted conductivity of cookware and bakeware. Now conduction is a relatively slow method of heat transfer because there must be more physical contact to transfer energy from one molecule to adjacent molecules. Now consider what happens when a metal spoon is placed in a pot of simmering water or soup. At first the spoon handle remains cool, but gradually however heat travels up the handle making it warmer and warmer and it becomes too hot to touch. Water is a, the better conductor of heat than air is. This explains why you cannot place your hands in boiling water at a temperature of 212 degrees, but you can place your hand, at least very briefly and quickly, into a 400 degree oven. Conduction is important in all cooking methods because it is responsible for the movement of heat from the surface of a food to its interior. As the molecules near the food's exterior gather energy, the move they move more rapidly and more rapidly and just keep getting faster and faster. Now, as they move, they conduct heat to these molecules nearby, thus transferring heat through the food from the exterior of an item to the interior of the item. Now, in conventional heating methods, non-microwave, of course, the heat sources causes food molecules to react largely from the surface inward so that the layers of the molecules heat in succession. This produces a range of temperatures within the food, which means that the outside can brown and form a crust long before the inside is noticeably warmer or even done. That is why a loaf of bread can brown on the outside, yet it still can remain nice and moist and tender on the inside. Now, convection refers to the transfer of heat through a fluid, which may be a liquid or gas. Natural convection occurs because warm gases tend to rise while cooler ones fall, causing a consistent natural circulation of heat. 
in a conventional oven, heated air, which is a gas, naturally circulates in and around the baked chamber. Mechanical convection relies on fans or stirring to circulate heat more quickly and evenly. This explains why foods heat faster and more evenly when stirred. Convection ovens are equipped with fans to increase the circulation of air curtains, thus speeding up the baking process. Now when we talk about radiation, radiation is the transfer of heat energy through the waves that move from the heat source to the food. It does not require physical contact between the heat source and the food being cooked. Think of the heat radiating from a glowing coal of a fire. Heating elements within a conventional oven radiate heat into the oven chamber. The metal walls, which absorb the heat, these heated walls then radiate heat back into the surface of the food being baked. For this reason, foods placed closer to the heating element or oven walls will cook more rapidly than those further away. Baking pans also radiate heat. Place your hand over, but not touching, a sheet pan that has been in a hot oven for a few minutes, and you will feel the heat as it radiates up. Next, we're going to talk about infrared cooking. Now, infrared cooking uses an electrical or ceramic element heated through to such a high temperature that it gives off waves of radiant heat that cooks the food. Radiant heat waves travel at the speed of light in any direction, unlike conventional heat, which only rises. Until they are absorbed by the food, infrared cooking is commonly used with toasters and broilers. Then everybody's favorite, microwave ovens, also rely on radiation generated by a special oven to penetrate the food, where it agitates water molecules, creating friction and heat. The energy then spreads throughout the food by conducting and by convecting into liquids. Microwave cooking is much faster than other methods because energy penetrates the food up to a depth of several centimeters, setting all water molecules in motion at the same time. Heat is generally quickly and uniformly throughout the food. Microwave cooking does not brown foods on, however, and often gives meats a dry, mushy texture, making microwave ovens an unacceptable replacement for your traditional ovens. Because microwaves radiation affects only water molecules, a completely waterless material, such as a plate, will not get hot. Any warmth felt on the plate when microwaving results from the food being heated conducted from the food to the plate. Baking and cooking methods. Now most of the heat transfer of concern to the baker and pastry chef take place in the oven. This is a dry heat cooking environment where circulating hot air is in the medium that cooks the food. Foods can be cooked in air or fat, or in water, steam, but what we're gonna talk about is dry heat cooking methods. Using air or fat are the principal methods employed to bake and cook batters and doughs. Baking and frying are methods used when preparing many foods, including yeast breads, cakes, and donuts. Dry heat cooking also includes the cooking methods associated with the savory kitchen grilling, roasting, sauteing, and even pan frying. These are for the most part, the secondary most important part in a bake shop. As you can see on the table on your screen, moist heat cooking methods, those are used using water or steamed. They are poaching, simmering, and boiling techniques regularly used to cook fruits and other pastry components, as well as steaming. Moist heat cooking methods are used to tenderize foods and enhance their natural flavor. They are also used to heat liquids to encourage evacuation, resulting in an intensified flavor or a reduction, such as a syrup or sauce. Moist heat methods such as simmering are used to gently heat mixtures so that proteins set and the mixture thickens, such as for custards and creams. Detailed procedures and formulas applying these methods to, to the specific videos are found on this table. Now the baking process. Many changes occur in a dough or a batter as it's baked. A pourable liquid solidifies into a tender, light, fluffy cake. A sticky mass becomes chewy in cookies. A soft, elastic dough becomes firm, crusty in French bread. These physical changes are the result of the ingredients used. The mixing methods employed and the effect of the heat applied during the baking process. 
Now, namely, gases form that and are trapped within the dough and batter. Starches, proteins, and sugars cook. Fats melt. Moisture evaporates, and stalling begins. By learning to control these changes, the baker also learns to control the final product. Control can be exerted in the selection of ingredients and the methods by which those ingredients are combined, as well as the baking, temperature, and duration of time. Now here are your stages of baking. Batters and doughs pass through 10 stages during and after the baking process. On this table, we are going to talk about temperatures at which physical changes take place in foods. The number one stage is fats melt. Number two, gases form. Number three, gases are trapped. Number four is microorganisms are killed. Number five is when your starches gelatinize. Number six, your proteins are going to coagulate. Number seven is your evaporation of water and gases escape. Number eight is your sugars caramelize, other known as the Maillard reaction. Number nine, your carryover of baking occurs, and number 10, your stalling begins. Now on the table that you're seeing in front of you, we have temperature range of 32 degrees. The physical change, of course, we all know, water freezes and solidifies. At 70 degrees, fats begin to melt. At 140 degrees, proteins begin the coagulation and the product becomes firm. At 150, that's when your starches begin to gelatinize and produce the thickening power that they produce. At 212, water boils and becomes steam and it starts to evaporate. And at 290 degrees, sugar begins to brown and pro the products actually darken. And this is when we call it the Maillard reaction. Now fats melt with their low melting point between 70 and 130. Most fats begin to melt as soon as the batter or dough is placed in a heated oven. As fat melts, droplets are dispersed throughout the product. These fat droplets coat the starches or the flour granules, thus moistening and tenderizing the product by keeping that gluten strands very short. Any water that is present will turn into steam at higher temperatures. Fats also coat egg proteins, interrupting the development of a baked goods structure. Fats melt at different temperatures though. Those that melt at lower temperatures such as butter tenderize more than those melt at higher temperatures such as vegetable shortening. It is important to select the fat with the proper melting point for the product being prepared. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about gases. A baked goods final texture is determined by the amount of leveling or rise that occurs both before and during baking. This rise is caused by the gases present in the dough or the batter. These gases are carbon dioxide, air, and steam. Air and carbon dioxide are present in doughs and batters before they're heated. Air may be incorporated during the mixing process. Carbon dioxide is released as a byproduct of leaveners, such as yeast, used in these mixtures. The formation of gases be begins upon mixing and continuous as a product is heated until it reaches a temperature of around 170 degrees. Steam is one gas that is formed when heat is applied. For example, steam is created as the moisture in a dough is heated. Yeast and baking powder rapidly release additional carbon dioxide when placed in a hot oven. These gases then expand and leveling the product. Now when gases are trapped, the stretchable networks of proteins created in a batter or dough, either egg proteins or gluten, traps gases in the protein. With an appropriate network of proteins, the gases would just escape without causing the mixture to rise. Proper mixing, mixing ensures the appropriate protein development in the batter or dough. As a batter or dough may contain beneficial yeast, organisms as well as harmful bacteria and molds, most die at temperatures about above 140 degrees. Now the temperature can vary depending on the type of microorganisms and the quantity of salt and sugar that you have in this formula. Now you're gonna see three slides that are gonna pop up and it's gonna go all the way from the gelatinization of the starch, of the uncooked granules, all the way from the, the, the heated granules and the fully gelatinized uh, granules binding into a solid mass. 
Starches are complex carbohydrates present in plants and grains such as potatoes, wheat, rice, and corn. Flour, which is approximately 70% starch, is the primary ingredient in most baked goods. When a mixture of starch and liquid is heated, remarkable changes occur. If you look on the pictures, starches begin to absorb and capture moisture up to 10 times their own weight, beginning at temperatures as low as 105 degrees. When starch granules in a batter or dough reach that temperature of approximately 140, they absorb additional moisture and expand. This process is referred to as gelatinization. Properly gelled starches contribute to the baked goods structure. Gelatinization occurs gradually over a range of temperatures of to 140 degrees to 212, depending on the type of starch present. And the amount of water in a formula affects starch gelatinization. Not all starch present in cookies or pie doughs gelatinize because of the low moisture content in those such formulas. Now, proteins begin to bond and coagulate or solidify when the dough or batter reaches temperatures of 160. And on the next three slides, you're going to see proteins get larger complex molecules found in every living plant as well as animals. They form from amino acids that are chemically bonded into long, loosely folded chains. In the presence of heat, the protein chains unfold or denature which allows them to rebond and solidify into a solid mass. In other words, as proteins cook, they lose their moisture, shrink, and become firm. Common examples of coagulation are egg whites changing from a clear liquid to a white solid when heated and setting the structure of wheat proteins, gluten, in bread during baking. This process provides most of the baked goods their structure. Proper baking temperatures are important for controlling the point at which proteins coagulate. If the temperature is too high, proteins solidify before the gases and the product have expanded fully, resulting in a product with poor texture and reduced volume. If the temperature is too low, gases escape before the product coagulates, resulting in a product that may collapse. Most proteins complete coagulation at 160 to 185 degrees. Now on this next table, you're going to see gases that leaven baked goods. We're going to go over the gas, which is air, and all products, especially those containing whipped eggs or cream fat, it's present in. Steam is present in all products when liquids evaporate or fats melt. Carbon dioxide, they're present in products that contain baking soda, baking powder, baking ammonia, or yeast. Now water evaporates and gas escapes Throughout the baking process, the water contained in liquid ingredients will turn to steam and evaporate. This steam is a useful leavener. During the early stages of baking, starting around 160 degrees, the product is porous, allowing these gases to escape readily. As steam is released through the dough or batter, it dries out, starting from the outside, resulting in the formation of a dry yet pale crust. The loss of moisture also means a product is losing weight. In this case of bread, around 10 to 14% of the weight is lost during baking. Although this varies greatly depending on the size of the loaf, its shape, and whether it's baked in a pan. Distinctive aromas from gases such as alcohol and carbon dioxide signal the most important stage in baking. Pay attention to the aromas and smells during baking. Aromas can work as well as a timer to signal when to check your baked goods for doneness. Now we're gonna talk about sugars caramelizing. And we also know that as the Maillard reaction. Uh, you'll hear me talk about Maillard reaction uh, through a lot of videos. Um, it's what makes food taste amazing. Um, but as soon as water evaporation slows, slows down around 300 degrees, the surface temperature of baking products will start to rise. As sugars in baking goods are heated above 320, they break down and darken or caramelize. And again, um, this process is known as caramelization, or again, the Maillard reaction. The result is a gradual darkening of the surface of a baked good. Sugars are simple carbohydrates used by all plants and animals to store energy. Sugars are found in eggs, dairy product, and other ingredients in your formula, not only in refined sugar and liquid sweeteners. Caramelization of sugars is responsible for most of the flavors associated with baked goods. 
Because high temperatures are required for caramelization, most foods brown only on the outside or through the application of a dry heat. The Maillard reaction, named for the French scientist who discovered this principle, describes the process of sugar breaking down in the presence of protein. Maillard browning results in the darkening as well as the development of pleasing uh, nutty baked flavors. Some of the aromas and flavors of roasted nuts, chocolate, and coffee derive from the Maillard reaction. Now let's talk about carryover baking. The physical changes in a baked good does not stop when it is removed from the oven. The residual heat contained in the hot baking pan and within the product itself continues the baking process as the product cools. This is why a crisp style cookie or biscuit may be soft and seem a bit underbaked when removed from the oven, but it will finish baking as it cools. A baked product cools other than noticeable changes, also other noticeable changes take place. At first, these changes yield with pleasing characteristics and are essential. Fats are going to solidify, causing the product to be become firm. Sugars are going to start recrystallizing, given a pleasant crunchiness of the crust of the cookie, for example. When these changes become unpleasantly noticeable, the product is considered stale. Now, your stalling begins. Stalling is a change in baked goods Texture, aroma caused by both moisture loss and changes in the structure of the starch granules. Stall products have lost their fresh aroma and are firmer, drier, and more crumbly than fresh goods. Stalling is not just a general loss of moisture uh, into the atmosphere. It is also a change in the location and distribution of water molecules within the product. This process known as starch retrogradation. It occurs as starch molecules cool down and become denser and expelling moisture. In breads, the moisture migrates from the interior to the drier crust, causing the crust to become tough and very leathery. If the product is not well wrapped, moisture escapes completely into the surrounding air. In humid conditions, the crust on unwrapped bread absorbs, absorbs moisture uh, from the atmosphere, resulting in the same loss of crispiness. The flavor and texture of breads can be revived by reheating them to approximately 140 degrees at which the temperature is where the starch gelatinization starts to reoccur. Now, usually products can be reheated only once without causing additional quality loss. The retrogradation process and temperature dependence, it occurs most rapidly at temperatures approximately 40 degrees. Uh, therefore, baked products should not be refrigerated unless they contain perishable components such as cream fillings um, and so forth. It is better to store products frozen or at room temperature. As long as the food safety is not of concern, products containing fats and sugars which remain retain moisture tend to stay fresh longer. Now, commercial bakeries usually add chemical emulsifiers, modified shortening or special sweeteners to retard the stalling but these additives are not as practical for your small scale production. Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. I hope you learned a little bit about the science um, and some different methods about baking. Um, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button and uh, hit that alert button and you'll be alerted anytime we come out with a new video. We'll have some demos coming up soon. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.